And I'm sure Richard Lambert from the CBI and Brendan Barber from the TUC will mention this. But people were saying maybe five or six years ago, OK, the science is frightening, but can we afford to do anything about it? I think the way the debate has changed over the last six months is that people increasingly believe we can't afford not to do something about this problem because the costs of climate change are actually greater than the costs of preventing it. So Nicholas Stern is the, or was until last March, a couple of months ago, the head of the uh, Government Economic Service. He reckons that stabilization of the climate will cost about 1% of global income by mid-century. But the costs of business as usual are much greater, anything from 5% of global income to 20%. So we're talking about an economic investment here, preventing cost, preventing tax rises, rather than simply a cost that we have to pay uh, for no good economic uh, purpose. And I think that helps to frame the sort of international challenge we face and the domestic challenge. I just want to say a word about the international agenda, and maybe when we have questions, people will want to uh, ask a bit more about that. Because we do need every country in the world to be part of, part of this. The United States is 25% of global emissions. Soon, China will be greater than the United uh, States. There's a critical meeting next month uh, of the 13 largest countries, it says G8 there, which is the group of eight leading industrialized countries, the five uh, countries that are emerging economies are joining them. Uh, and that will lead through to December when the United Nations uh, annual convention on climate change meets in Indonesia. And that needs to start the process of a new round of global negotiations in which every country takes on an appropriate level uh, of commitment. And that international agenda is absolutely critical. But today is really about what we do at home. And I think it's worth saying that we need to make change at home, partly because it's in our economic interest, but also partly because I, as your climate change negotiator internationally, have no chance of persuading India or China or other countries to make changes in their own way of development if we're not making changes ourselves. So the changes here are in our own interests, but they're also about facilitating global change. Now, in terms of uh, at home, we're not very good at this in Britain, but let's start by saying we're actually doing quite a lot. We're one of the only countries in the world to be uh, on track to double the commitments that we took, nearly double the commitments we took under the Kyoto Protocol, which was signed in 1997. And I always like to put it next to our um, economic performance, because our economy uh, over the last uh, 15 years has grown substantially. You can see that on the left-hand side. And meanwhile, we've managed to reduce the level of pollution that we're putting out into the atmosphere. And I think that is the first time since the Industrial Revolution that we've broken the link between economic growth and pollution growth. In other words, to grow your economy, you don't have to increase the amount of pollution that you uh, put out there. But we've got to do more. And that's what today uh, is about. You've all been sent details of the climate change uh, bill, and that's uh, critical for today's uh, event. We're in a pre-legislative phase of discussion which all parties and uh, communities are involved in. And it is the world's first eco-constitution, environmental constitution, with the four key uh, elements that I'll say a word about. First of all, the commitment to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by at least 60% by 2050. And Gordon Brown said that in the future, Chancellor of the Exchequer will be counting the carbon tons in the same way that they're counting the pound sterling. It's as big as that, the change that we are making. Secondly, we think it's important that government just doesn't invent this on its own. It needs independent advice. And that's why there'll be a committee on climate change which will provide uh, annual updates on progress, but also uh, five yearly recommendations on how we uh, set our uh, carbon uh, aspirations. Third, we think it's important to ensure that we've got the proper powers to establish the right systems for reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Half of our pollution at the moment is covered by a Europe-wide emissions trading scheme, which we can say more about. But we need to be able to extend that. And fourth, we think it's very, very important that the public and business, uh, as well as government, are able to see progress. And that's why there'll be annual reporting. And I just want to say a word. Why, people say, why should you bother to think between now and 2050? What's the point of that? The answer is that business say to us, you've got to give us long-term certainty about the nature of the challenge we face. Only if we know the sort of changes that you want will we be able to make the investment decisions. And that is the case for the long-term uh, offer that we're making, or the long-term proposals that we're making. The uh, 
Uh, people then say, well, how are we going to meet this target? 60% reduction sounds like a lot. I just want to pick out three areas that are absolutely critical to all our lives and are critical to almost every one of the discussions that I've heard around the tables this morning. I want to say a word about electricity, heat, and transport. Together, they account for 90% of the UK's emissions. So if we're going to get a 60% reduction, we're going to have to get it in those areas of electricity, heat, and transport. And if we're going to get it in those areas, we need government to get its own house in order, we need business to take action, and we need individuals as well. Just in respect of electricity, we, at the moment, we only have, I'll only be able to pick out some things on each slide. 4% of our electricity comes from renewable electricity at the moment. Very low proportion. We've lived with North Seoul and gas for such a long time. But when I went onto the internet to change my electricity supplier, it just took me three or four minutes to change my electricity supplier from someone who was supplying electricity from coal to someone who was supplying electricity from wind power. It's actually not that difficult. It was much easier than I expected to change my electricity supply. Now, if one person does it, that doesn't change the world. But if a lot of people do it, you can make a difference. And that's one of the themes that I think will come through. But there's also technology that allows us, um, people can ask questions about this if, if that would be useful, uh, to ensure that uh, coal-fired power stations are much less polluting than before. In essence, you could bury the uh, uh, pollution uh, in former oil wells. And there's also a big scientific debate about whether nuclear fusion could offer a ver the ultra-clean source of energy in the future. But in respect of electricity, we need significant uh, change. Home heating is a second uh, area, and business heating, that I heard about. And many of us now, with rising energy prices, I think are more conscious of our heating bills than we were before. But here, the technology exists uh, as well. I've also just had my um, cavity wall insulation uh, done in my uh, home in my constituency in South Shields. That insulation makes a diff big difference. At the moment, 8 million houses in this country haven't got cavity wall insulation. We've got to find a way for individuals to want to get that change, for businesses to be supplying the services at a competitive price, and for government to be offering help for those who need financial support. But we also need a business to rise to the challenge. And if you look at the third picture there, the zero carbon buildings, we've said to the house building industry that from 2015, every single house they build will have to be zero carbon not just a reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of it, but zero carbon. So setting standards, tough regulation, business responding. Third, and in some ways the most difficult area, is transport. I don't have time to talk about aviation, but I'm happy to talk about that uh, if necessary. Um, I actually came by tube today, so, but, but usually my ministerial car is, a, is an electric car, a Ford, uh, a Toyota Prius. Uh, we know how to get around using electric vehicles, and it doesn't mean all of us driving around in milk floats. Actually, Electric vehicles can be uh, quite whizzy. They don't have to be uh, very uh, staid. But we're going to have to get the systems right so that people want to do it, business wants to supply the cars, and government gets the tax regime right uh, as well. So in those three areas of electricity, heat, and transport, there's responsibilities on government, there's responsibilities on business, and there are opportunities for individuals. And I guess that's where I just want to finish up my uh, presentation uh, this morning. Uh, 44% of the UK's emissions come from the decisions that are made by you, us. 44%. Our decisions on electricity, heat, and transport, and to a small extent, waste, which was discussed on one table. Waste and recycling is not to be, is not minuscule. 3% of our emissions come from waste, and that's an important uh, part of the agenda. But 44% uh, of the UK's total emissions come from the decisions that you and I make. And this group that's been brought together here is representative of Britain. There are people here who live in all parts of all regions of the country. There are people here who are passionate about climate change, and there are people who are not. Uh, there are people who believe that in the science. There are people who, who don't. We need to use the conversation today to help think through what does it need to take in terms of government action and business action to allow individuals to play a big part in helping shift this uh, agenda. And I just finish on the following point. Climate change is sometimes described as an environmental issue, and I am the Secretary of State for the Environment. But actually, the more you look at it, the less you think it's an environmental issue, the more you think it's an economic issue, a social issue, and a cultural issue as well. Because if you're a throwaway society, a wasteful society, you can't live within environmental limits. And the truth is, you can't legislate for culture. You can only help change it. And that is what today 
is about. Thank you very much indeed for listening.